Okay, let's try this. So yes, um, it's uh, interesting following Joe because I'm trying not to be too like, you know, in a morass of despair, but I kind of expected that and I'm sort of happy to go after. Um, so who here um, runs infrastructure of some kind or services? Um, and who here would say they, they own some infrastructure's code? Okay, then this talk is for you because we need to like do stuff and I, I hope Joe's gonna have ideas for how to make our lives better. But in the meantime, we're gonna have to make this stuff run, so. Um, so this is me, um, I'm Fletcher. I'm happy to be here at Atomicon. Um, I think the unicorn's gonna be called Sed. Uh, <laughs> um, I work uh, for a company called Chef. Um, I don't know if we have a vendor pitch, so we'll leave it at that. Um, and I work on a tool called Test Kitchen um, on and off when the mood strikes and when people have interesting problems. So uh, you can get a hold of me here on the internet. Generally, it's fnickel on GitHub and Twitter and whatever else, fnickel at chef.io. Um, so here's where I wanted to start this talk uh, was, was with some um, hand wavy statements. Um, the problem is I've already used these hand wavy statements with people and I've had nothing to back it up. Other than some intuition and a little bit of experience, it seems like, you know, it's kind of makes sense to me. So, um, or maybe put another way, um, at least in my opinion before this, um, you need to run this, this code like all the time. And that's like the only way you're going to know if it's actually running. And if you like don't look at it and leave it in a corner for a little while, you're probably going to be sad on Monday or next month when you like crank it out and rev it up and... Um, you know, Debian's moved their, their package repo URL on you over the weekend. Um, so th these are things that I felt were true, but were kind of hard to um, really back up with anything other than like anecdotes, analogies. Um, as a community, we're really good at using metaphors and analogies um, to, to kind of talk and explain what we're going through. What I was hoping to find is like um, some reason, some study, some uh, something a little bit more concrete that, that I could kind of put behind the statement so I could just keep saying it and I don't have to change my mind. So confirmation bias maybe, but. Uh, <laughs> so I guess to, to sort of back up and start, this is sort of where I'm starting from. Um, I think everybody, uh, all the speakers so far have had probably slightly different degrees, uh, different definitions of infrastructure's code. Um, this is the one that, that usually resonates for me. Um, this kind of goes back, this is sort of one of two things that at least for me has sort of changed the trajectory, trajectory of my career. Um, I was a very happy application developer um, and I thought I could just, you know, have a little side trip into automating some servers and I could get back to writing code. But um, a few years later and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm here. So um, this is uh, from Adam Jacob, this is from the web operations book. Um, and the, the idea is you can, you know, you can reconstruct your business um, from scratch. All you need, ideally, is some source code somewhere, um, a data backup, and some compute resource. So um, the source code repository here, I, I'm going to um, kind of drill into that, treat that as sort of the, this infrastructure's code as a starting point. So I don't necessarily mean like a Turing complete programming language. Um, it might not even be a programming language. Uh, this could cover Docker files. This is what you would need when the world craters in and you happen to have everything somewhere in a, in a repo. Um, this is what you start from to build artifacts and boot yourself back up. Um, would that be a stretch, Adam? Am I, am I like totally... I'm going to assume I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, so uh, to boil it down a little bit more simply, um, for me, infrastructure's code is software. It's, it's just software. Um, that might be really simplistic, but for me, this is the mind little the mind hack um, that makes everything possible in, in my world. Um, if we can treat infrastructure's code as software, software as sort of a, a discipline, software engineering, computing science, um, there are procedures, practices, um, there's, there's research, um, and that's the stuff that I want to tap into to kind of like rein in this giant beast of nobody knows what we're doing, um, but we're doing it really, really fast. Um, so I, I went to the library um, a bit ago uh, to try and um, 
give me some bullet points to sort of uh, back up what I want to say off the, the start. Um, and it took me a little while because I didn't know really how to look for what I wanted to look for. Frankly, it had been a long time since I went back to my, the university where I had my comp sci degree, um, was trying to remember how I get access to scholarly journals and what those even would be for software engineering. Um, so I found this one. Um, it was published in 2001. Um, I really am not expecting anybody to have seen this one before, but has anybody come across this particular one? article before? I'm going to guess no. Um, so what jumped out at me was this, this idea of code decay. So this is what um, I think I've been trying to, uh, to come to terms with, this idea that like I work on a, a body of code, whatever it is, um, or I don't, and I leave it, come back, and it just does not work as advertised, even though I know it worked um, previously, or it works less well than it did previously. So um, this, uh, this article, it was published in 2001. It was against uh, a really large code base. So it's not like the Hello Erlang people telephone systems, because it's C and C++. Um, but it's probably in that, in that genre. Um, 100 million lines of code, which is non-trivial. And it's code that had been around for 15 years. So they basically looked at the change of this code base over time by inspecting the change management you know, history. So you can think of like your Git log or CVS. And uh, I don't know how many entries they had, but 15 years at 100 million lines of code, it's probably a few entries. Um, you can see, I don't know how often the releases were, but that's a fair amount of churn for 20 million lines of code on each release with a 100 million lines um, code base body. Um, so th they had used this metaphor um, from medicine, so we're back to metaphors here in um, software land. Um, thinking about a code base um, like a patient suffering from a disease, so that sounds kind of terrible and pessimistic, but um, that was the idea, is um, software suffering from decay can be thought of as being diseased. Um, and if you can look at it that way, you can start to apply the ideas of like symptoms and risk factors, and so um, some more quantitative and some more qualitative ways of, of looking at that, um, uh, this code. Um, so they had uh, defined this uh, decayed code as a unit of code, is, it's decayed if it's harder to change than it should be. Um, and then it's, there's a few measurement criteria. So the harder to change than it should be was um, something I had highlighted like a thousand times because I've that seems to be like a daily thing that you go, you see a feature you want to do or fix a bug, you think this will be easy. And then like the next day you're still on it and you've been, you're 20 x deep and you can't remember what you were fixing. Um, and it seems like it's, it's like that more and more. Um, it just gets harder and harder it seems like. Not every day, but. Um, so the, the measurement that they, um, they, were, they were kind of using in this, um, uh, to get a sense of the, this code decay. Um, one was for, for a change set, again, this is like a, an entry in like a git commit kind of thing, um, is the cost of the change. So um, this would be, you know, how many, how many developer hours were spent and that kind of thing. Um, the interval to, to uh, complete the change, so how many days did it take, that kind of thing. And then the quality of the resulting change code. So did it get better, did it get worse? Um, and they, they had a, a few interesting points um, that they had sort of uh, called out. The idea, um, at least in, in this paper, was that uh, decay is sort of temporal, so there's a time element. Um, and it might be more useful to think of uh, code decay as perhaps the change you wanted to make um, is more difficult now to commit than it might have been at a, a, a point in the past, which is a little depressing. Um, but I've had those days as well. Um, and haven't really been able to um, explain why that it feels that way sometimes. Um, code can also be correct and still be in a decayed state. Um, it's it's uh, not always hard to know uh, what code's going to do, even if it's um, uh, even if you've got like failures that you know will happen, or it's slow, or um, you can often have it fulfill its job even if it's not ideal. Um, and lastly, this is, if 
felt a little counterintuitive, but it made sense that um, frequently code bases that might be decaying the most might also be um, simultaneously increasing value. Um, and if you think about it, probably the code that everybody um, deals with at their workplace and the, the one that they don't want to touch the most, if you really think about it, it's probably the one that's providing your company the most uh, value. And it's probably because everybody has to dogpile in and add features and fix bugs because that's what you're running your business off. So that's a little sad. Um, and in this article, they, they were, um, they wanted to call out that, uh, that this decay was um, the result of like concrete developer changes to the code base. Um, I would kind of extend this a little outside of that. Um, uh, the, at least my experience with um, different infrastructure code, this could be Puppet Manifest, Chef Cookbooks, Docker files. Um, You've got that like leave it on the wall factor, and I've done this with like even even bash code that like leave it for six months and then try it again, and it will find a way to expose a dependency that you didn't know you had, or a DNS record that's now expired, or an SSL cert that's that's just expired. So um, it's tough to explain why. I, I think it's because when when uh, we're dealing with this like infrastructure code level stuff. Even at the application, we're sort of seeing the full stack effects um, that sometimes maybe application developers see a little less of, um, especially if they're in like a nice platform as a service platform, because what they're seeing in theory is like highly available services that are always there and they behave and they fail over and they do the right thing. Whether or not that's the case in reality, um, that's, that's another story. Um, so the, I'm actually gonna just skip a little bit ahead here. Um, the, the changes um, that they had sort of like classified looking at all these, they kind of fell into three buckets, roughly. Um, so there was adaptive change, so you could think of that as adding new features, um, fulfilling a new requirement, that kind of thing. There were corrective changes, which was sort of break fix, bug fix. And then this perfective change, which seemed very tongue in cheek, uh, and that's why there's a bit more words around that. Um, they called it maintenance for maintenance sake. Um, Re-engineering, this sounds kind of bad, but this is also the kind of class of uh, changes where you might need to uh, rescue a module, a, a part of your subsystem in order to accommodate future change and features. So without this third class, you don't want to necessarily write it off because you're probably driving into a hole much quicker. Um, so they, they also had um, a list of symptoms. Um, if these things are true, uh, perhaps you have problems, or perhaps your code base is, is falling into sort of a decayed state. Um, so this is symptoms in the same way as the medical patient um, idea. Um, so like I have chest pains, that might be a symptom of heart disease, um, that kind of thing. Um, so excessively complex and, and bloated code, um, that's probably not too surprising. Um, a history frequent change, so code churn would be one. Um, GitHub even has um, some kind of metrics on projects, so you can kind of get a sense of, of code churn. I know Code Climate also has a reasonable idea of code churn. Um, and it's, it's interesting when you can look at the, even the frequency of incoming bugs versus code churn. Um, sometimes this can be a good thing because you're sort of steering out of a bad place. Sometimes this is just a matter of accepting a lot of features and a lot of stuff is getting kind of built on top of each other and the result is, um, you know, ill-defined behavior. Um, the widely dispersed changes would be um, possibly symptomatic if, if you're seeing that your patch sets are starting to touch more and more files, more and more modules, more and more components. That's probably a hint that maybe there's some factoring abstraction, some architectural um, stresses that, that might be uh, popping up. Um, and finally, the, this idea of numerous interfaces or, or entry points. Um, if, if you've had um, the good fortune of working on something um, that ends up being a wild success and you wanna add features to that or you're accepting features in, um, I'm, actually, I'm actually now thinking of um, the former iteration of the, the Heavy Water Graphite Cookbook um, that uh, I, I spent a little bit of time on when I was at Heavy Water. We had, it could do almost anything, and with the surface area of, of graphite, over time, it would have supported everything. Um, 
but with like a thousand ways to configure it. So um, that, was, uh, that was a project where we kind of table flipped a little bit and rethought a few things. Um, and this was definitely, um, I guess, a, a symptom that was sort of lying in there at the time. Um, but I would say for us, it gets, it gets worse than just that. Um, I would argue that a lot of the code that we write in this infrastructure space, while it's getting better, it still has a pretty low fault tolerance um, threshold. So it doesn't take much for a whole system or service to sort of crater in on itself. And that, it almost doesn't even matter where in the stack that's happening, if that's very low level, if that's you know in the infrastructure level, if that's the application level. Um, not much can go wrong before things go really wrong and can kind of cascade. It's something that we're getting better at. Um, if I, I might misunderstand what Kelsey's talk is about tomorrow, but if there are some lessons from distributed computing, um, I think there's some good stuff there. And I would highly recommend the Release It book um, for anybody who hasn't seen it or, or read it. It's, um, it feels to me like it's sort of the Netflix playbook for how to write defensive paranoid software. Um, that is expecting you know, everything outside of itself to attack it. Um, and that's the way you want to write code in general. Um, we also have issues with um, dependency management complexities. This is like, um, this is at sort of runtime um, with software. Uh, this could be package dependencies, but also um, just external dependencies like the network, like DNS, like um, SSL, upstream package repositories. Um, if you don't know what those will be, just run your software over a long enough period of time, um, and you're eventually going to find it. You just write them all down, <laughs> and it gets kind of depressing. What can go wrong? Um, and these aggressively changing runtimes. So uh, you know, the Linux kernel marches on. It gets new features. Um, there's you know Linux and other distributions that uh, they retire their support for things, and all of a sudden you're in a newer world with a different uh, init system, say. And um, it's sometimes hard to go back, or it's sometimes you're very much fighting um, the world, uh, trying to trying to stay in one place. Um, it's, it's getting increasingly hard to sort of stay in one place. It feels like these days. Um, so the other. Um, thing that, that kind of came out of my um, trip to the library um, was this idea of, of entropy. So um, this Shannon entropy, as I understand it, is from information theory. Um, it came from uh, this person whose last name is Shannon um, in 1948. So it's um, been around for a bit. Um, so it's the idea that um, that uh, it it's kind of deals with a level of randomness or uncertainty as a result of a message or a result of, of taking an action on a system is, is kind of how I'm thinking about it. Um, so it might, make, um, it might make sense just to, to take an example. Um, so if you can imagine um, you're in an election and somebody commissions a poll to you know, ask a question about uh, an issue of policy. Um, the reason for, for having a poll is that you don't often know what the result is going to be. And until you sort of run the poll and get the results, it's only at that point that you gain the information about you know, what, what the public thinks. Um, so the first time you're running that poll, um, your sort of entropy or your uncertainty is really high because you don't know what you're going to get. Um, once that poll's happened, though, you know, after a short period of time, if you were to rerun either the same poll or a, a slightly tweaked poll, um, the entropy um, of that next poll is going to be a lot lower because you already sort of know based on the last poll what you're likely going to get for the next one. So now you have sort of a reference point and your sort of class of uncertainty is now a lot smaller. Um, and you can kind of go the other way to sort of a more pure random um, high entropy place when you're just doing like a coin toss. So your first coin toss is effectively random. And your second coin toss, no matter if it's like right after or like 100 years from now, it really has no bearing on the first coin toss. So you're always in like a very highly random, high entropy kind of uh, place. Um, so this was another um, dissertation that I had found. And it was talking about entropy and software systems testing. Um, so that's kind of what the, the entropy idea was that, um, that I touched on there. Um, and this is from 2011. So these were actually, these aren't very old um, papers. I had a few more about um, uh, the cost of finding bugs. And those went back to the 80s. So um, this stuff isn't um, necessarily groundbreaking. It's just I, I don't see it out there very much. 
Um, so she's um, making the, the point here um, that we want to test our software systems because there's uncertainty in the actual behavior. So we want to kind of verify that the behavior is what we think it is. Um, and I, th I think this is relatively intuitive um, when you're kind of thinking about like running some acceptance criteria against, against any code base. Um, the more we test, the more we know about that system under test and how it behaves. Um, it might not be perfect and it might not be for every time, but we're gaining more, less uncertainty. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't call it more certainty, I would just call it like my confidence is increasing in this code because there's a little less uncertainty in, in the world. Um, and the more we know about the system under test, the more likely um, we can find faults. So the way I've been sort of thinking about this in my mind is um, this idea of entropy kind of being this vertical thing, so high entropy, low entropy, and um, over time. So kind of the, the line down is, is us like running some kind of test against the system. So this might be running server spec um, after running Puppet or, or Chef or um, you know, uh, a smoke test against uh, a running booted Docker instance or, or something like that. Um, but you'll see over time sort of that uncertainty, that entropy is sort of like it's creeping back up um, just like it always does. Uh, you know, you come back to it six months later and wonder, does it actually work? Like I, I really, I need to run it to see if it actually works so that I have that confidence again. Um, and then you, you see the spike down, but this trend over time is probably not going in the right direction. You can sort of contrast that to the idea of, I just want to run this all the time, much more frequently. Um, and because the result from the last time, you know, from six hours ago, from yesterday, from last week, is probably gonna have a better bearing on if it runs today. Um, you're hopefully, by exercising it, kind of gaining that confidence and sort of lowering that, lowering that amount of uncertainty. Um, now, I think what I did here, there we go. So this is where I start to change a couple words around. So I just dropped the idea of testing, and because all I care about is exercising the code, let's just call it execution of this code. Um, and we'll swap out entropy for uncertainty because it's probably easier to explain to people. Um, and what you find, or, or what, what I kind of found was like the line going down when you're, you're actually exercising it, that's sort of your code in use. So that's um, provisioning um, new services, that's um, running acceptance tests, that's running your CI environment, um, that's running a, a CD pipeline. Um, and then the, the rise is basically your code decay in effect. So it, it's a bit weird to have a, a word called decay with an upward slope, but that's the idea. Um, so there's basically these two things that are always sort of um, happening, th these kind of two tensions that um, as practitioners, uh, uh, or at least for myself, I want to have in my mind going forward that I know that there is this thing over time that's eventually going to sort of at a minimum eat away at my confidence about, about the code that, that I'm writing and, and using on a daily basis. Um, but also knowing that there's a way that I can sort of battle that. And it's a bit of a heavy kludge and it's not too elegant, but just running it is giving you some point of reference that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, you can see that kind of reflected in the continuous delivery book. This is a quick quote. I'm, I'm guessing most people have probably seen it. Um, it's the idea that if something hurts, do it more frequently. And I would argue, like going back to that graph, that's probably one of the reasons why you want to do that. Um, so that's why I'm just going to keep saying that this is true or more true because now I read, um, I skimmed a couple papers and highlighted some stuff. And, uh, and you can do it too, because um, I'll post this online and you can see the references and then you can just paste screenshots and do the same thing. So, <laughs> so that's all I got, thank you. <laughs>